Hello whiskey fans and welcome to Whiskey Stuff and today I'm going to be trying to answer the question what do you do when you get a bottle of whiskey that you just don't like? So rather than gift it to someone else or even worse tip it down the sink why not try to make it better? Ah, Queen Margot, my old nemesis. I'm going to try and release this after the, the review for Queen Margot so that people actually understand why this whiskey is here in this video about what to do with a whiskey that you don't like. <laughs> if you have seen that video, then you'll probably know exactly why it's here. So today I'm going to have a little look at the practice of blending your own whiskey at home. So I feel like there's a little bit of snobbery and it's a little bit taboo to talk about blending whiskey because a lot of us, and myself included, engage in a lot of snobbery when it comes to blended whiskey. A lot of people say that, oh, I'd never drink a blended scotch, never buy anything like that. It has to be single malt all the way for me. And to be honest, I tend to agree a lot of the time that a lot of the blended whiskey that you can get, especially blended scotch, is substandard product it's cheap it's not for people who appreciate their whiskey and a lot of the time it's just not good but where i think we really need to break this taboo is when the blending actually happens in your own home because especially if you have some whiskey that you really don't like and you're not going to drink in any other way you can actually do some really good stuff by mixing things together yourself you also have to remember that almost all whiskey including single malt is actually blended when you buy whiskey, unless it's single cask, and even then, sometimes single cask whiskey can be blended, most distilleries will be selecting several casks in their bottling hall, which a lot of the time doesn't happen actually on site at the distillery anymore, but they'll be selecting different casks from different years, different cask types, and just casks that have matured differently possibly different spirit from different spirit runs that's been distilled in different ways and they'll be blending those casks of single malt from that same distillery together to make the product that they want to sell and at the end they'll still call it single malt because all of those casks have come from the same distillery so it's perfectly legal to call it that so really if we as the customers decide to take some bottles of whiskey, possibly from the same distillery, possibly from different distilleries, and blend them together to suit our palate, I say there's no harm in that. Because really, you're just doing what the distilleries have already done. As to how well the result actually comes out, well, that depends on how well you do it. So I'm going to put the Queen Margot aside for now. We'll come back to that later. But I'm just going to start off with another little example of some other whiskies that I think go together quite well if you blend them yourself. So I'm going to start off with the Bladnook 10 year old. So this is a whisky that I have reviewed and it's a whisky that I like. It's not a whisky that needs to be changed in any way. It's a perfectly enjoyable one. Now the reason why I've chosen to start off with Bladnook 10 as the base to my blended whisky here is because I think that is often a good idea, especially when you're first starting off with blending whiskies, makes it a little bit easier. If you start off with something that's a little bit of a, for want of a better word, a neutral base. So some good examples of things that work well as a, a base for a whisky. Obviously in the blended scotch industry they'll probably use grain whisky which is pretty much as neutral as you can get. But what I'd recommend is kind of a classic bourbon matured scotch. So something like Glen Murray or Crabby's Yard Head, Bladnock 10 year old, those sort of things. Glen Cadden perhaps. So Bladnock 10. Fairly stereotypical bourbon maturation. Lots of caramel, vanilla, honey, some lovely malty notes. It's going to work really well if we use it as a base to add some extra flavours to. 
And what you need to think about is what flavors are going to work well together, what's going to complement and contrast and accentuate the flavors that you've already got in the glass. Although saying that, it's not always obvious how things are going to interact when you actually mix them. So it does require a little bit of experimentation. And sometimes you get it horrendously wrong and you waste some whiskey. <laughs> so always try to work in small volumes. I'm not going to be doing it today because it's a bit of a pain. I'm just trying to produce a video and have a little bit of fun. But I wholly recommend using a graduated shot measure so you know exactly how much of which whiskey you're mixing in there. And if you do make something that you really like, you can easily recreate it, perhaps with the whole bottle if it's something that you really enjoy. So what I'm going to do this time is going to add a little bit of the Laphroaig Cask Strength 10 year old, it's the batch 12 that I recently reviewed, I'm going to add a little bit of that to the Bladnick 10. And the reason I'm doing this is because to start with, if you keep the ABVs high, I always think that's quite helpful. Because quite often when you're blending whiskies together it is quite easy, especially if you're blending a lot of different things, to end up with a, something rather muddy that tends to lose its way. And keeping the ABV high on at least one or two of the whiskies that you put in can help to avoid that. And the other reason why I'm putting this in there is because we're starting with a lovely, creamy, mellow, neutral base and we're going to add some heavily peated flavour to this whisky to make it a little bit more interesting. So I'm just going to mix this around two parts Bladnock to one part Lefroy, I would say. And we'll see what that's done. For you doing this at home, it is a really good idea to make sure that you give the whiskey time to marry and mix properly in the glass. Give it some time. So I'm going to give this a little bit of a swirl to make sure that it has blended together. But it is important to give it enough time. Put a little cover on there and just give it a few minutes to make sure that what you're tasting is what you're actually going to end up with. So that is immediately a different whiskey. And it's no longer single malt. What we've got now, it's not blended scotch either, it's a blended malt. So exactly the same as your Johnny Walker Green or your Monkey Shoulder or your Naked Gross. It's a mix of two different single malts, so it's a blended malt. And even though we've only put no more than a third of the Lefroy into this, it really stands out. And I think those heavy medicinal briny PT qualities go really well with the butyric, slightly off milk, creamy notes that you get in the Bladnook. Hmm. Hmm that does work really well. I have done this before, but just tasting that, I don't remember it working that well before, <laughs> but it really does. And it's interesting how when you nose this whiskey, you do probably get the majority of the flavors coming through from the Bladnook, but when you taste it, that's where the Lefroy really takes over. And one of the reasons why I really like this combination when I did it before I made this video is that I do think that the PT medicinal qualities of the Lefroy really go a long way to counteract some of that really extractive tannic dry woodiness on the palate, on the late palate of the Bladnook. So by mixing these whiskies together, we've got something that is possibly arguably a little bit more complex and interesting than the Lefroy on its own, which is an amazing whiskey in its own right. And you've taken the Bladnook, which is still easily identifiable in this blended malt, and you've smoothed it out, because those, what I would describe as a little bit of a flaw, that really dry woodiness that you get on the late palate of the Bladnook, it's now mostly gone. And if anything, it mixes really well the dry woodiness that you can still taste a little bit goes really well with the briny medicinal qualities of the Lefroig. I 
I'm not going to say that it's better than either one, but it's a really nice experience to take two whiskies, in this case two whiskies that I really enjoy, and see what you get when you blend the two together. Because this is probably something that nobody else in the world has ever had. Although if any of you out there have got a bottle of Lefroy Cosk Strength and a bottle of Bladnock 10, I do wholly recommend that you give it a go. Let's try something else, shall we? So this time I'm going to start with another fairly well-rounded and inoffensive whiskey as a base. But this time I'm going to take a little bit of a risk and go with a sherry matured whiskey. This is my fairly recently reviewed and nearly gone bottle of Famous Gross Naked Gross. So this is actually already a blended malt. So let's get a little bit of this in the glass. And I'm going to aim for around 50% Naked Gross in this one, I think. And I'm going to add to that another Laphroaig but it's a different Lefroy, and I'm about to commit a little bit of a sacrilege here, so any of you out there who are a little bit squeamish, please turn away now. But I can't apologise too much, because we are being radical and progressive here today. We're being new and edgy and exciting. Going to add a little bit of the Lefroy Karchis 2020 Port and Wine Casks. Only a little bit. And as I said, really should be using a a graduated measure for this but hopefully I've added around half as much to that as I have the naked grouse let's just put this up here next to the naked grouse to keep track of what's gone in and lastly I'm going to add something else a little bit special this is the 2017 Diageo special release of Kalila. So this is an 18 year old cask strength Kalila, but it's an unpeated Kalila. And I haven't actually reviewed this one yet. I need to soon. Review is coming at some point. So again, hopefully that was around 25% Kalila. So out of those three, 50% naked gross, 25% uh, red wine and port cask Lafroig, and 25% unpeated cask strength Kalila. So the ABV on this one is going to be pretty high. So we've got 40% on the naked gross, 52 and 59.8%. That's another thing that you have to consider when you're mixing these things. If one of the whiskies that you're mixing is considerably stronger, then maybe add a little bit less because it is going to have a little bit more of an impact over your 40% whiskies. So this time, I think the blend has really turned into something else. Whereas with the Bladnock and the Lefroy cask strength, you could really tell the two whiskies were still there. This time it's really merged into something new. You can definitely smell a huge impact from the wine casks, the wine and the sherry and the Pedro Jimenez and all of those grape based things that have gone in there. And there's also quite a lot of medicinal peatiness and there's a pepperiness as well, which I don't think you really get to this extent in any of these whiskies. So by mixing these three together, we've actually accentuated and drawn out a flavour that was a little bit hidden before. Sherry and especially port and grape-based casks are a great one to add to blended whisky. And I think all master blenders know this little secret, that if you add enough sherry and port casks to a whisky, it has this miraculous ability to smooth out and improve the balance and really integrate all the casks together. So you don't want to add too much, but in the right quantities, a little bit can go a long way in smoothing out something that's a little bit rough and unsure of itself. Let's see how it tastes. Must be said that that is probably the most full and intense blended malt whiskey that I've ever had. 
One of the things that I don't like about blended whiskey is it quite often ends up muddy and indistinct, has no real direction. It can be drowned out by this muddy, over-blended, often grain whiskey or caramel or vanilla sort of flavours, and you don't get much else. But with this one, you've got so many flavours in there that are all working together and singing harmoniously. And it has to be said, I'm not an expert at this. Some of them clash a little bit, but it's a wonderful thing. Mmm, that peatiness. And the wine cask as well, really cut through from the carcass. You've undeniably got that lovely, sweet, Christmas cakey, sherry foundation from the Naked Grouse. You've got some lovely flavours built on top of that from the Laphroaig with the wine casks and the, I think a lot of the medicinal qualities, the peatiness is coming through from the Laphroaig. Because the Kalila, even though it's unpeated, has a little bit of peat to it as well. But the reason why I added in this Kalila 18 year old is because it's a beautiful, bright, fruity, sharp whiskey and that really cuts through. Master blenders, they'll actually call this technique of adding something a little bit special that cuts through the mix. They actually call it top dressing. And it's a really effective little trick because it not only allows you to turn something that's quite run of the mill, quite mundane, and turn it into something special, but it also allows you, if you choose to do it properly, to turn some cheaper stock into something that's a lot more enjoyable. If I ever come across an enormous fortune, I think I would set up my own independent bottling company. I think if you had unlimited money, cost was no object, and you were careful about it, you could spend an entire lifetime having a lot of fun blending different whiskies together. And I think you'd come out with some really interesting things that are probably impossible to create from a single distillery. And that is, after all, why Diageo who is probably the biggest name in blended whiskey, why they own around a third of the distilleries in Scotland. It's not all about dominating the market. It's about having a huge palette of flavours to draw from to create all of your blended whiskies. And because they own them, they can do it all at cost prices as well. But as it is, I must say that I don't really rate blended whiskey. I think as a category, it's got huge potential. But what we actually have available to us on the market, I think it falls into one or two camps. It's either the cheap stuff is just too cheaply made, or the good stuff is just too expensive to justify the price. Which is why we, the customer, have to take it upon ourselves to do this experiment ourselves and make it more of a commonplace thing to be blending your own whiskey at home. Anyway, just give me a second to tidy this away and we'll see what we can do to fix this Queen Margot. Okay, Queen Margot, three-year-old blended Scotch whiskey. Apparently won a silver medal at the IWSC, which probably says more about the IWSC than it does about this whiskey. So this time I'm going to use a little bit less of the Queen Margot because it's going to be the base in this whiskey. Because apart from going as low as vodka or drowning it out with neutral grain spirit, which they've had a fair go at themselves already, there's not really anything else you could use as a more neutral base for this one, I don't think. So I'm going to try and go one part Queen Margot and one part of two other things. So I'm going to keep this fairly cheap as well because the objective here is to try and turn Queen Margot into something drinkable. So we don't want to spend a huge fortune doing that. So although I did commit the sacrilege before of mixing in very expensive Laphroaigs with technically much cheaper whiskies, I'm not going to do that this time because that would just be a waste of money. So the next one that I'm going to add to the Queen Margot is the also very cheap and also from Lidl, Glenorchy. So this is a blended malt at five years old, but it's a lot better than the Queen Margot. So I'll try and get an equal measure of the Glenorchy. So already that should have improved things. Mm. 
Mm. <laughs> so I'm smelling, I'm basically smelling the two whiskies in the glass at the moment. And to be fair, that could be because I haven't given it time to mix. But there's still a lot of ugly notes there coming from the Queen Margot. I've just mixed them with some fairly nice notes from the, the Glen Orkey, which we'll put up here. So that's not going to cut it. I think we're going to have to add something else to this one. Going to add third part. It's going to be a mystery ingredient, at least to you out there for a little while. There we go. So that is our third ingredient in the mix. And doesn't that look a lovely colour? <laughs> It doesn't look a particularly natural colour, does it? But that is much better. It actually looks a little bit... No, it's darker than that. I was going to say it's a similar colour to the Lefroy Karchis port and wine casks, but I think it's even more red than that. But doesn't smell bad now. The notes that I'm getting now, it's a little bit, it, it tastes a lot like a port matured whiskey. There's definitely a saltiness and almost a blue cheese note, which I think is probably coming from our mystery ingredient mixed with the Queen Margot, but I'm not getting any of the actual identifiable flavours from the Queen Margot on its own. What I am getting is some of the brighter, sweeter, juicy, fruity notes and the maltiness from the Glen Orkey, which is really nice. So we've effectively top dressed the Queen Margot with the more expensive, much nicer blended malt. And the mystery ingredient has been added <laughs> rather suspiciously to just accentuate everything. And it's made it a much more rounded experience. Very salty, very malty, a little bit grainy. Getting a little bit of smoke coming through, possibly from both of those. Probably mostly the Glen Orkey. Not, not a huge amount of smoke. Let's see how it tastes. That is beyond a shadow of a doubt, much more enjoyable. It's the most enjoyable way to consume Queen Margot three-year-old blended scotch. Nose is a little bit unusual, but it works. And on the palate, it's actually a lot like a fairly young single malt whiskey that's been heavily treated with a finishing period in in Pedro Jimenez port or possibly red wine casks. I think if you gave this to a hundred whiskey experts, I actually, if you could up the ABV on this and you gave it to 100 whiskey experts, I think that 90% of them wouldn't realise that this isn't a very heavily cask finished whiskey. That's perfectly enjoyable. I like that. <clears throat> so I'm going to put you out of your miseries and tell you what the mystery ingredient was. <laughs> So the point here is that we all need to not only stop being snobs and break down our taboos, but also think outside the box. Because the law says that you can't directly add port to a whiskey, although how much port is actually in some of these fresh port casks when the whiskey is racked into them for the finishing period is a secret that the, the people at the distilleries will probably take to their grave. 
because there's probably a lot more in there than they probably should leave in there. But the addition of the Glenorchy has done a lot to top dress the Queen Margot, and that port has really rounded things out and made it it's made it seem a lot older than any of the base components actually are. The only thing that I don't quite like about this is it has brought the ABV down a little bit too much because these two start off at 40% and the tawny port is not going to be a lot. It's 19% so it's a reasonably strong tawny port but it's probably brought the ABV down probably towards the 30% mark and that does make it a little bit weak for my tastes. Although saying that, what we could do <laughs> in the interests of science, how is this going to turn out if we add a little bit of our 59.8% cask strength, unpeated technically, Kalila to this mix? So I'm going to go fairly easy on this. Maybe around 25% of each now. Let's give that a swirl because we haven't got all day. And see what that's done. Hmm. It's actually not bad. <laughs> I expected that to be thoroughly horrible. And on the nose, it is pretty horrible. <laughs> that Kalila, it's a bit too foisty and a little bit too peppery. But on the palate, it's given it that little bit of a boost made it a little bit brighter which has cut through the port a little bit and that quite works on the palette not so much on the nose I don't think I'll be doing that one again <laughs> if we get rid of this one I think I have proven there to myself at least that there are ways to make any whiskey no matter how horrendous it is drinkable if you're willing to put a little bit of effort into it so hopefully anyone watching out there who is considering dumping something particularly nasty down the drain will be inspired to give it a little bit more thought now and maybe have a little bit of fun in the process. In the comments be sure to let me know what you've created at home which has been absolutely wonderful and what the worst and most regrettable thing that you've blended together out of whiskey is. I look forward to hearing from you. Cheers. Thank you.